Welcome back to The Small Nonprofit, the podcast where your passion meets action. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Grab yourself a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. We're going to chat all things trust-based philanthropy today. My guest today is Megan, who I've had the chance to actually work with as a, as a fundraiser. So I'm really excited to introduce her to you and have her share all her tidbits on her side of philanthropy, which you'll know what I mean in just a second. Hi, Megan. Hi, Maria. It's so lovely to have you. I'm really excited about this conversation because I feel like people don't usually get to hear from people in your role. So maybe you could introduce yourself a little bit and tell our audience what you do. Yeah, I am Megan Lorius, and I'm the managing director at the Sprott Foundation. Um, we're a Toronto-based foundation that grants across the country to organizations that are seeking to solve hunger and homelessness. We began that work in 1988. It's a long time. It's a pervasive issue. It's not solved yet, but we're seeking to make sure that everyone is housed and fed fresh, healthy food. So that's our our funding mission and we're big proponents of trust-based philanthropy so i'm really happy that's the topic i think that label would apply to us by observing how we operated so that's a lovely position to be in but i do still consider myself a student of trust-based philanthropy as i think we all should be lifelong learners in our pursuit and in our life generally uh, I just want to give you a huge shout out because just like working with the Sprout Foundation while I was an in-house fundraiser director of development, we made things so easy. So just some of the things that funders do that are really, really difficult for staff will be like, write this 140 page grant. Like I've actually done a 140 page grant for $400,000 a year. Or, you know, upload every resume of everyone on the leadership team. Basically, they're just asking you for your grandmother's blood type or something like that. Like, yeah. ridiculous, yeah. really in-depth, like, super kind of paternalistic mm -hmm. um, questions that are micromanaging everything that you do. And the Sprout Foundation was never like that. Even for a grant request or a mm -hmm. multi-year renewal, it was always like, just send us a quick paragraph of what's been happening. Like you are already so good at updating us. Like we don't need to be wined and dined. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that really stood out to me as uh, as a funder is, so we did this petition around increased social assistance rates and wages in mm -hmm. Ontario, because that's obviously one of the main things that keeps people in poverty, keeps them yeah. food insecure, X, Y, and Z. And we asked our community to sign it. And of course that includes our community of donors. And the Sprout Foundation signed it. Of course. This we happen though. Like sometimes funders are like, oh, don't get too like political right. or, but you know, food yeah. insecurity is a political by nature topic. Like it's it people is. experiencing poverty and that's why they're. And we very much have the philosophy that we're here to help. We're not here to impede. And having you fill out a hundred page application form for funding is impeding your work at the end of the day. It's taking time away from your frontline mission work and seeking other donors and just basically slowing you down. I'm glad you brought up that example, actually, because it reminds me that at the Sprott Foundation and the Sprott family, they're quite entrepreneurial. And so they support all facets of a way that an organization approaches things. And, and we look to the organization to know best how they should be operating and we don't stand in the way and we're there to support where we can. So signing something, absolutely. As my colleague Juliana Sprott would say, she's our chief giving officer, we, we're a family foundation. We're not looking to be reelected. We don't care if we step on people's toes on the way through. We're not nervous about what perceptions will be out there about where we put our line in the sand. So we're flexible that way and we can be supportive where organizations need us. And just talking about Juliana too, like I always found it so interesting how open she was to 
a lot of the things that come with trust-based philanthropy and community-centric fundraising. She was just always so open to learning more and was actually teaching her family about some of these things. So I love that about her. And I'm really excited to talk to her on the podcast as well on how she adopted that mentality. But just quickly, I wonder if you could walk us through the principles of trust-based philanthropy and how the Sprout Foundation applied them. Yeah. So what we discovered, and, and as I mentioned, is we kept on being given the label of trust-based philanthropists, and it came very intuitively for the Sprott Foundation to put their trust in the charities that they were supporting and to support them and their needs in how they determined. Um, so from the very beginning, since the 80s, um, that was the approach they took. Um, and they really supported organizations in being entrepreneurial, as I said. So looking for new ways to approach an old problem and taking a, a place-centric approach, you know, looking at all of the variables that are unique to this situation and designing your own solution. So with that approach just emerged really by nature, the applying of what have emerged as trust-based philanthropy principles. And so we've now looked at, and there, there is the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project that provides tools and is, and is putting words and a framework to what has been burbling for quite some time amongst foundations to be more supportive and partner with organizations. So one of the things that we have almost always done is provide multi-year funding. And multi-year unrestricted funding is kind of principle one of trust-based philanthropy. Um, and I say we're still working on being completely unrestricted in our funding. Um, we do, do still find that there are um, areas where we stipulate because, for example, we're supporting uh, children's um, boarding program, but the meal component. And so we do want the budget for the meals protected. And we do stipulate that it's to feed fresh, healthy food to these young athletes so that they can uh, be their best, um, for example. Um, but we are moving quite a bit more into unrestricted funding um, because I think we've been at this long enough and we have long time grantees that we have established a mutual trust with. We know them so well, and they have such a long track record of stewarding funds well that unrestricted just makes sense. And so that's something that we have learned as we've gone along. We also touched on this. One of the other principles is to simplify and streamline paperwork. We're a big proponent of that because we don't want reams and reams of material to read and we do the work. That's another principle uh, of trust-based philanthropy is that you don't put all of the work onto the grantee. We really believe that you should be working frontline to support those that you serve and not spending your time reporting to us. So those for us really go hand in hand. And for example, with our location for funding, we often will bring the final reporting and the application for renewed funding together. Just give us your report on what you did with the last round of funding. That's your proof that you are a good steward of the fund and that you're a trusted partner. And then just ask us for renewed funding. Demonstrate you did what you said you would do with the previous round of funding. Explain why it's still needed. Unfortunately, it is often still needed. And generally what you'll do with the next round of funding. Because we work so closely with every uh, grantee and we have a working relationship and we're so knowledgeable about what they're doing, where they're at, what the landscape is doing around them. Juliana and I are well positioned to go to our board, do the heavy lifting, as it were, to inform our board, make sure that they completely understand what the charity is doing, how they're addressing their mission, 
of how they operate, that everyone is a kind of a, a solid partner um, involved. And because of that, because of the back and forth relationship, one of the other principles of trust-based philanthropy is um, soliciting and acting on feedback. And because we're very informal and we don't we agree with tons of paperwork, it's not like we're out there surveying and asking our grantees to fill something out and tell us how we're doing. We're talking with them and we're very open to feedback. I think that, again, is around another principle of transparency in your actions with your grantees. And I think you'll agree, Juliana is probably the most transparent person out there. All cards on the table. She's very open with what's going on with us. Was very open at a stage in our journey at the Sprott Foundation when there was the potential of sunsetting and closing out the foundation that maybe things had run its course. Thankfully for me, their decision to carry on was when I was hired by the foundation. So I'm very happy for that. I'm also happy for philanthropic landscape and for charities in Canada that the Sprott Foundation is still around to support their good work. So I think you're sensing the theme here where everything is kind of mutually reinforcing um, each other, all of these principles of trust-based philanthropy. And we're always going back and re reviewing and refreshing and making sure we're on track. We follow the philanthropy project and read their blog and see what's the latest. Because really, they're about shifting the power that historically there has been a power imbalance. There remains a power imbalance between donor and donee because we hold the purse strings at the end of the day. And so we, well, we're trying to hand over those reins. I think we do a decent job at the Sprout Foundation in, in everything that I've mentioned. We really trust the organizations to know best what they need with the funds. And we look to organizations to outline what funding they need and how they'll utilize it, how it'll have an impact on the community and on those they serve. Um, but at the end of the day, we're constantly working to shift that power, to make sure that the uh, voice of the grantees is elevated, amplified, that we're supporting it in things like signing the petition that you mentioned and all those myriad ways that you can assist an organization when you're very knowledgeable of what they're doing because you have a close relationship. I love when you're mentioning like shifting power because that's something that traditionally funders have really want to kept their hands on, right? Mm -hmm. So like I decide what this program is going to be or mm -hmm. you're going to do a social enterprise program for these food insecure people and teach them how to run their own business. And it's like, I get that might seem like a good idea mm -hmm. if you're not here every day, you yeah. know, like you don't see it every day. So that the Sprout Foundation was never trying to direct our programming. Mm -hmm. That was super helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, so the Sprout Foundation is huge and it's run by some of the wealthiest people in Canada. We also had another donor who was in the same wealth bracket and in their granting guidelines, the expectation was to send Christmas cards and gifts to the family. Oh my goodness. So it's like people that I've never met because it's just like there's a granting officer so they don't even want to have a relationship with the organization really that I'm sending Christmas gifts to during the busiest time of the year. And also they're billionaires. So anything that I send them is going to be like, I don't know. Man, I've never heard of such a situation. Yes. And so you didn't ask for anything like that. That was kind of like a wine and I. And then the other thing that I really liked was there was never this kind of, no, I don't want to meet with you, the director of development or you grand officer. Like I only want to meet with the ED. Like the ED is like, the all-powerful person. I always felt like the Sprout Foundation wanted to connect with as many people at the organization as possible, whether they were programs or the ED, but it was never like, no, I want to talk to the most powerful, hierarchical person available for me to build that connection. I really love that about the partnership that we had at that organization. And yeah. that's why I was super keen on like, please come on the podcast because you do things in a way that I think other foundations, other granting institutions could start to at least try to replicate. Mm -hmm. 
A lot of people were thinking about like power and wealth and all mm. those things post the murder of George Floyd. But I don't know if they know actionable things that they could do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I am in the unique position and the Sprott Foundation is in the unique position that it is a family organization. They lead with their heart and take a human approach. And we can because we're small. I am the only external employee. Juliana Broad, as our chief giving officer, is an employee of the foundation. And I'm so lucky to work with her every day because you can corroborate. I'm sure she really does bring the passion. And she brings a very strong voice to the role. But at the end of the day, the whole family really centers human dignity and equity, equality, in what they do, the, the non-hierarchical, Juliana and I are colleagues. We don't report to each other. I don't report to her. We both report to the board. That's the approach they take. We want to talk to the folks at an organization that want to talk to us, that have the time to talk to us. We don't want to disturb the workflow. We're very much there to support you, your processes, so if you were saying as the grantee that this is the person you need to talk to, bring it on. They're obviously well positioned to inform us the way we need to be. And we really appreciate that. I really like knowing who is working under the ED. And it is kind of for us a bit of a diagnostic of how an organization is running. Because if we only ever talk to the ED and there's this gatekeeping happening, it has happened on occasion, but we like to see, you know, we talked about shifting power. Well, shifting power within the organization too, that, that the folks at every level on the org chart, and for those not watching the video, I'm air quoting, we want to know it's not a demand, it's not a stipulation. But to really understand an organization who is offered up to talk to us about the work that's being done is a piece of knowing and understanding an organization. I think like true partnership, like that's what it depends on, right? Like being mm -hmm. very comfortable, like coming in and being like, hey, I'd love to volunteer. Well, yes. Yeah, that's nice of being a good host to someone who's mm -hmm. space, but ideally, it's just better to do it in partnership. So like one time when you came in for a tour, we ate together the mm -hmm. meal that was prepared for our service users just to like, this is what we do. This is how we do it. And it's good and good. Like it's great. Yeah. And we feel very comfortable serving it to our donors as well. It's not a separate secret, mm -hmm. secret meal being prepared. Yeah. So yeah, well, like I always really value that as well. Yeah. But I wanted to ask, have you heard of what is this called? Oh, here. Crappy funding practices. Crappy funding practices. Very descriptive. I'm imagining it has not crossed my radar, but I get it. Basically, it's this new LinkedIn page where they're calling out funders who are doing things in a very way. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I think you would really enjoy it, but I'm just scrolling through some of them and it's like a $15 application fee is required. Foundation to a point from funding. I know. What are you going to do with $15? And then some of it's in order to continue to be eligible. A grantee must meet all the following criteria. And one of the criteria is having maintained a balanced budget over the past three years. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's just like there's so many things around the power dynamics, around these like barriers that sometimes funders, but also I wanted to say also nonprofit. Because yeah. Yeah. sometimes like the gatekeeping is coming from inside the house. They're like, no, they can only talk to the ED or to the board chair, you know, the important people. Who are you? Yeah. There's which I think will people and approaches everywhere you go. Yeah. Which I think also is different with the Sprout Foundation because it's not about the money, if that makes sense. Like, I know it is a granting organization, but it's really about community and partnerships. I found that really nice. But I wonder if there's any grantors who are listening to this podcast, what advice you would have for them to start implementing it? Like if they've never even heard of trust philanthropy, I think they'd be a little bit further along, but what would you yeah, think so? Do from the get-go, I think educate yourself. 
know and understand the sector that you want to fund in and be funding from the heart. You, if you're a philanthropist, you should be looking to support something that you are passionate about. And as the Sprouts will say, they came from very meager means. Mrs. Sprott was born in a refugee camp in the dying days of World War II. It was a mess and they immigrated to Canada and had nothing. Remember being very, very hungry, starving and living in literally an unheated home to begin with, an air code home. They felt very strongly that having a decent meal and a place that was safe to lay your head was absolutely essential. It's a basic human need and for everyone's dignity should be a, a right. It is a right. And so they chose a mission that was so near and dear to them and they live it every day. And so I think for anyone getting into philanthropy or doing some soul searching about their philanthropy, making sure that you're so passionate about your mission and then educating yourself about that field, knowing what your potential grantees, current grantees maybe are facing, being very deeply involved in the sector and understanding it, and then in engaging with your grantees, potential grantees, being extremely respectful of their time and energy, their reality. Um, what are they facing and how are you interrupting their workflow to get what you need from them to make a grant decision? I think that's what we really prioritize for us is that we don't want to insert ourselves in a workflow that's going just fine to kind of stop and inform us or stop and do something for us. We, we never want to do that. And I, I think that no matter how big your organization is, again, I said, we're small, so we can be very nimble. We can go with the flow. Even a big organization, if you're centering your grantees, if you're centering the parities that you're hoping to help, and being very cognizant because you've done the homework of what they're facing in their daily work lives, I think we'll have a much kind of smoother system and better support for organizations at the end of the day when you being respectful of the organization up front, they remain more efficient and doing the work that you're looking to support. Uh, I wonder if you have any advice for fundraisers. So maybe I feel like sometimes fundraisers are scared to bring up these kind of topics with their donors. Like they yeah. feel, oh no, they definitely want to talk to the ED or, oh, they really want this program. Like, how do I even approach that conversation? Yeah. So I think knowing your target, understanding the organization that you're seeking funding from making sure that you're mission aligned with them and truly mission aligned. I do get applications or inquiry letters saying, you know, we're, it could be like, we're um, raising funds to buy musical instruments for our class and you're helping people who don't have money. So you should help us too. Uh, that's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> Don't try to put the square peg in the round hole. Um, you know, it, take a look at what we do, what we fund, the other organizations that we fund. If you are an apple in the orange bag, move along. There will be a fit for you. And then reach out. Find the right person to reach out to and make an initial contact. Do not, for us anyway, do not go to the work of putting together application, any deep case su for support that you send just unsolicited. I think making that initial contact, verifying what the organization's process is and getting to know the organization, the funder a little bit up front makes a ton of sense and is more efficient for everybody. 
Are there any final thoughts you would leave our audience with today? I think just we're all on this journey together. And we as funders at the Sprout Foundation, we love funder collaboratives. We love the collaborative approach. And we do that formally by joining organizations that are funder collaborative driven. And we collaborate informally just with other like-minded foundation. We, in a few cases, have come together with other like-minded foundations kind of on the side where one of us finds out about a great project and brings the others in uh, and we fund together. I, I think that just around that, that trust-based philanthropy principle of transparency and open dialogue and doing your homework, just being much more open to conversations, networking, collaboration, because at the end of the day, we all are just trying to do the best for folks who need a leg up, who, folks who might be struggling at this moment. And it doesn't matter what your area of funding is. At the end of the day, we all are just trying to do good. And I like to think that every human is just trying to do their best uh, on any given day. And just to approach philanthropy and the relationship between donor and grantee with a bit of grace on both sides and just really try to build the, the human connection. Because I think when the examples that you've used, things fall down when we lose the human connection. When you're asking for hundreds of pages uh, on an application, there's no human connection there. You're not valuing the person's time on one end. And well, I think you're valuing your own time if you really want to read through a hundred page application. So just being humans, being really awesome, good people to each other at the core, I think will get us a long way. Thank you so much for coming on, Megan. We don't get to hear from donors on podcasts or blogs or anything like that about why they're doing what they're doing and how they're doing it. So I just think this perspective, although fundraisers talk to donors all the time, they might be asking these questions and also they'll talk about it publicly when it's such a big foundation, well-known foundation. It's so helpful to know what funders are thinking, how they're approaching things, how things have shifted. Also for people internally who are like, oh, I don't, I don't know, right? Like it just a little bit more confidence of like things have changed. Like you can have these normal conversations with your donors, poor people. Yeah. Just keeping the human element in it is such a lovely sentiment. Thanks so much for having me. You're doing wonderful work, giving a stage to people to share their ideas and around the, you know, let's just come together and work together. Just sharing ideas the way you're doing and providing this platform is really wonderful. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Okay, so for people who want to get in touch with you and they're like, I want to connect about getting my foundation to be a little bit more along, how can they do that? I am easily found on LinkedIn. I have a unique name, Megan Lorius. There aren't any others on LinkedIn. You will find me very easily. There's so many Maria Rios like everywhere. Uh, but okay, so people can connect with you for that purpose. Please do not message Megan for funds, okay, guys? Don't do it. Do not do yeah, it. We are closed to unsolicited grant applications at this time. I'm always happy to share ideas and bat things around. I love that. Okay, thank you so much, Megan, for joining us again. And thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of The Small Nonprofit. I am really looking to bring in more donors into these conversations because sometimes it feels a little bit of a siloed echo chamber and we really want to include our whole community into changing the philanthropy landscape. So I'm hoping to have more conversations coming your way. But until then, bye for now. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Small Nonprofit. If you want to continue the conversation, feel free to connect with our guests directly or find me on LinkedIn. Let's keep moving money to mission and prioritizing our well-being. Bye for now.